भारत की कहानी हेलो फ्रेंड्स एज अ पार्ट ऑफ सेलिब्रेटिंग आजादी का अमृत महोत्सव वी रैन अ पॉडकास्ट सीरीज कॉल भारत की कहानी मीनाक्षी लेखी की जुबानी 75 स्टोरीज फॉर 75 डेज रन अप टू इंडिया 75th इंडिपेंडेंस डे नाउ दीज स्टोरीज व्हिच वर अर्लियर अवेलेबल ऑन द वेबसाइट ऑफ आजादी का अमृत महोत्सव Spotify and various other platforms mm. now be available to Namo app virtual meet as Bharat ki kahani Meenakshi Lekhi ki zubani happy listening keep listening and stay tuned to Namo app it's an initiative of Namo app volunteers i thank them all through you Bharat ki kahani Meenakshi Lekhi आजादी के लिए प्राणाहुति देने वाले पिछहत्तर अनाम वीरों की पिछहत्तर कहानियां मीनाक्षी लेखी की जुबानी हेलो फ्रेंड्स नमस्कार टुडे आई ब्रिंग टू यू अ स्टोरी फ्रॉम द नॉर्दर्न हिल्स ऑफ हिमाचल प्रदेश दिस स्टोरी इज अबाउट बाबा काशीराम काशीराम वाज एन इंडियन पोइट एंड एन एक्टिविस्ट ऑफ द इंडियन फ्रीडम स्ट्रगल ही इज द मोस्ट प्रोमिनेंट फ्रीडम फाइटर फ्रॉम द कांगड़ा हिल्स Kashi was born in 1882 in a poor Brahmin family in the Kangra district of Himachal Pradesh. His father Pandit Lakhnu Ram was the village priest and Kashi was introduced to religious literature early in life. He went to a neighborhood school where he learned Urdu and Persian, the two languages taught in Himachal Pradesh at that time. He was a voracious reader at school and took an early liking to folk songs, music and poetry. Once his basic education in the village was completed he moved to Noorpur for employment and took up a job as a munshi which means clerk he did not enjoy it much so he moved to Lahore where his maternal grandfather belonged to Lahore was not just a big city but also a confluence of culture there young kashi was introduced to new ideas and cultures in Lahore He was also introduced to Sufi poetry and classical music. He came in touch with celebrity poets like Sufi Amba Prasad and Lal Chand Phalak who composed the famous patriotic song Pagdi Sambhal Jatta. Kashi himself joined classical music classes and started to write poetry. Initially, his poetry was all about reminiscing the simple village mountain life which he had left behind, but later His poetry found a purpose and he talked about the freedom struggle in great detail. His work documented various important incidents of the history of India's freedom struggle. His mellifluous voice they say added to the charm of his poetry. In Lahore, Kashi had the good fortune of meeting Lala Hardeyal who was considered the doyen of Indian revolutionaries. He also met Lala Lajpat Rai with whom he worked on various occasions. Both had a deep influence on his life. When the mighty earthquake hit Kangra, he went with Lala Lajpat Rai for rescue and rehabilitation work. Young Kashi also witnessed the Delhi Darbar ceremony in 1911 and 12, during which a bomb was thrown at Lord Harding's carriage. He penned the entire incident in a powerful pahadi poem, Ghumi Kar Dekhiya, meaning as he washed around the british cracked down badly on all revolutionaries after the incident the main accused were hanged kashi too had to go underground so he returned to his village kashi's personal life was struck with tragedies his father passed away when he was 13 the very next year his mother too passed away his wife died after giving birth to two sons one of whom was barely 10 months his sister and sister in law both died young and it is said that at one point four people in his joint family died in one day his poetry therefore reflects a lot of sorrow too which he experienced in his life one of his well known poems dukhe de man koi rehm ni hota tragedy spares none but kashi did not let tragedy come in the way of his work 
He returned to Lahore and opened a shop in partnership with a friend. The business saw success, but the struggle in the country could not let Kashi rest. He therefore fully immersed himself into freedom movement. Kashi was in Amritsar when the Jallianwala Bagh massacre happened. The incident shook the conscience of the country as well as that of Kashi Ram. He vowed to not rest till the British quit India. He raised his voice against atrocities of the British and was sent to jail for 2 years. Once released, he went to Himachal propagating the message of azadi through his poems in pahari language to inspire people to join the freedom struggle he was arrested again by the british he was arrested 11 times by the british and the total of 9 years of his life was spent in prison but he used the time well by writing sensitive poetry something he excelled at some of his popular works to come out of his jail time were samajni roya नाकर गल्ला मुनमुन काने जाने दिया काशी रास सुनेहा उजरी कांगड़े दी जना हिस फेमस पोयम अंग्रेज सरकार दा तिगा पर तिहारे मीनिंग द ब्रिटिश गवर्नमेंट इज ऑन इट्स लास्ट लेग्स गॉट हिम जेल्ड येट अगेन ही हैड गुड रिलेशंस विद सरदार अजीत सिंह अंकल ऑफ भगत सिंह सो व्हेन द ट्रायो भगत सिंह राजगुरु एंड सुखदेव वर हैंग टू डेथ Kashi pledged that he would only wear black clothes till India got independence. He was nicknamed Sia Posh Jarnal or Black General. He kept his vow till his death in 1943. Being one of the biggest names among freedom fighters from the hilly regions, Kashi was given charge of Himachal to raise awareness about the freedom struggle. He had exceptional organizational skills. On one such occasion, when he had organized a political conclave in Husharpur in 1937 pandit nehru came there seeing his organizational and motivational skills and popularity amongst people he was affectionately addressed as pahadi gandhi a title which catapulted his popularity further and stuck with him even after his death but this was not the only title he received He once organized a public meeting in Una, Himachal Pradesh, which was attended by Sarojini Naidu. Kashi recited some of his pahari poetry in his melodious voice. Sarojini Naidu was so impressed with him that she nicknamed him Bulbule Pahad or Pahadan the Bulbul. Kashi was a prolific poet. In his lifetime, he composed more than 500 poems, 8 short stories and a novelet. Most of his poetry is autobiographical like Nana di Kahani Pahadiyan Kanne Chughaliyan Kandhi di Jawani among others Due to his slowing beard and demeanor he was later on lovingly called Baba A commemorative stamp was released in his honor in 1984 by the Indian Postal Department The Himachal Pradesh Department of Academy of Art Culture and Languages also instituted an award in his name for upcoming poets of the state baba kashiram may have died many many years ago but his poetry continues to inspire the people of himachal even today 55 days to go jai hind jai bharat bharat ki kahani आजादी के लिए प्राणाहुति देने वाले पिछहत्तर अनाम वीरों की पिछहत्तर कहानियां मीनाक्षी लेखी की जुबानी आप सुनेंगे अमृत महोत्सव पोर्टल पर 1 जून 2022 से रोजाना भारत की कहानी मीनाक्षी लेखी की जुबानी आजादी के लिए प्राणाहुति देने वाले पिछहत्तर अनाम वीरों की पिछहत्तर कहानियां Meenakshi Lekhi ki zubani Hello friends today I bring to you a story from the western part of our country that is Maharashtra the story is about brothers who came to be known as Chapeka brothers it was June 18 1897 british officers were returning from queen victoria's diamond jubilee celebrations which were being held at the government house in pune two officers lieutenant arrest and wc rand left the celebrations around midnight in their respective carriages little did they know that death was lurking in the darkness someone shouted gondia alare and two men jumped out 
opened the top of one carriage and shot the occupant. They then alerted their accomplice who ran after the second carriage. While these two caught up with him, together they opened the top of the other carriage and shot the second occupant too. The next day's newspaper carried the news that W.C. Rand, the chairman of the Special Plague Committee and his assistant, Lieutenant Iris, were attacked by local revolutionaries. Iris, the first to be shot, died on the spot and Rand was taken to the hospital where he succumbed to his injuries later. A massive hunt was carried out and ultimately, Chapika brothers were named as the assailants. One of the brothers, Damodar, was caught by the police and placed in Yerevada jail. His whereabouts were leaked to the police by their friends and members of the Chapika club, the Dravid brothers. It is said that the two brothers of Damodar, Balakrishna and Vasudev, killed the Dravid brothers to avenge their snitching to the British. Finally, the other two Chapika brothers too were caught. They were tried in the court of law, found guilty of the crime of killing two innocent people and sentenced to death. The Chapika brothers, however, maintained that they had done so to uphold the honor of their people. Chapika brothers, as they were popularly known as belonged to a conservative family of Pune. Their ancestors were wealthy, but their grandfather lost most of his fortune, leaving hardly anything behind for his children. Their father, Hari Vinayak, therefore started singing kirtans to earn a living. With no money to pay accomplices, he trained his three sons and formed a group. The children did not get schooling, but learnt a lot by attending kirtans, which were held in the houses of educated and learned people. Listening to discussions and readings, providing them with information which made them aware of the world around. Their life was proceeding normally till in 1896 the plague broke out in Pune. Though epidemics like smallpox, cholera were frequent in India, the average age of an Indian in those times was 21. Plague mostly happened in coastal areas or areas that had trading ports. The Pune was not close to the sea but was frequented by travellers from Mumbai. The British authorities had a lackadaisical attitude and thus plague was uncontrolled and re-erupted. But by early 1897, plague turned into an epidemic. Some said that it was due to traders who were selling affected grains but nothing could be ascertained. People started to flee the city as the mortality rate rose. Soon, nearly half the population of Pune had left the city. The government set up a special plague committee headed by Indian civil services officer Walter Charles Rand, resorted to stricter measures and called in an army of 800 officers and soldiers instead of doctors. British army took tough measures without respecting religious or social norms of the people as they were given a free hand by the authorities. Measures on papers included checks of houses, examination of people for medical checkups, quarantining people and curtailing their movement if required. The people of Pune went through hell as these measures were being used wrongly. The soldiers sometimes turned up at midnight, they entered houses forcefully, sometimes stripped the people even in public in the name of checkups, misbehave with women and even vandalize their property, including disrespected their places of worship. Even if there was a doubt about plague, the bodies of the deceased were not being handed over to the family and due religious cremation was not even allowed. This hurt the sentiments of people of Pune greatly. Even Bal Gangadhar Tilak wrote about these atrocities in his newspaper, Kesari and Maratha. Gopal Krishna Gokhale stated he had reliable reports of misconduct by the British officers. The people of Pune therefore formed their own clubs and discussed and detested the government measures during these meetings. As folklore says it, or the family of Chapika brothers today say it, that Chapika brothers witnessed that a mansurating woman who did not have her upper clothes was pulled in public and this information has been brought to us by the Chapika brothers' family. They took it upon themselves to punish the British and restore their honour. In a secretly planned mission, it was decided to kill the main culprit, the chairperson, 
of SPC WC Rand as that would help bring the issue to the forefront and stop the atrocities a meticulous plan was worked out swords and pistols were arranged the club members shadowed rand for days to understand his schedule finally june 22nd the jubilee celebration day of queen victoria was zeroed down it was the day when all british officers would travel till late and that would make it easy to ambush in the dark their call on spotting rand was gondia alare meaning targets arrived two brothers were involved in the incident and even the third brother youngest of them who had been married a short time ago was also picked up by the british authorities subsequently and all three brothers and their accomplices were hanged till death chapaker brothers defended the honor of the people of pune the british constituted a committee but did not find any wrongdoings on the part of the authorities however they must have changed their stand against the local population lokmanya tilak defended the chapaker brothers activities on the ground of misbehavior of the police with the women of pune lala lajpat rai is said to have called the chapaker brothers the founders of revolutionary groups in india 54 days to go jai hind jai bharat bharat ki kahani आजादी के लिए प्राणाहुति देने वाले पिछहत्तर अनाम वीरों की पिछहत्तर कहानियां मीनाक्षी लेखी की जुबानी आप सुनेंगे अमृत महोत्सव पोर्टल पर 1 जून 2022 से रोजाना भारत की कहानी आजादी के लिए प्राणाहुति देने वाले पिछहत्तर अनाम वीरों की पिछहत्तर She was always inspired to do newer things in life and believed in becoming a better version of a human being. At a very early age she has been listening to stories of punishing Indian revolutionaries by the ruthless British and at an early age she was inspired to make significant contribution to see a free India. As days passed by Uda Devi used to take part in various local sports and focused on health to remain fit. Apart from fitmen she used to loiter around the woods to climb up tall trees and view the whole village from the top slowly she became a great climber one such day when she was practicing climbing she suddenly noticed a group of young men who were secretly practicing shooting with pistols and sniper rifles instinctively uda devi knew that shooting is something that she will learn at any cost and instantly she jumped out of the tree and the boys were shocked to see her now that she was witness to the activity she insisted that she will keep it a secret only if they teach her shooting the men were little surprised at such a request and they asked the reason behind it as they ne- never heard such a request coming from any woman before and neither had they seen a woman pursue shooting yet the men taught her for days after days at different locations within the jungle later they saw that she turned out to be the best shooter amongst them when uda devi grew up she got married to makka pasi he was a soldier in the army of hazrat mahal one thing was common between them that is both grew up learning the stories of the british tyranny and they grew hatred towards them they wanted to contribute to the revolution against the british with each day passing by uda devi observed the rising anger of the indian people with the british administration she shared an amiable relationship with the begum of hazrat mahal uda devi reached out to the queen of the district at once with a fierce nature to enlist for the war in order to prepare for the battle that was headed their way 
Looking at the danger that was knocking at their door, the Begum helped her form a women's battalion under her command. Uda Devi was handed over the charge to lead the women battalion. She and her Dalit sisters were amongst the warriors of the 1857 Indian Revolution or first war against the British East India Company. When we talk about Uda Devi, we must also learn about the Battle of Sikandarbag. As the British were approaching, Uda Devi instructed her fellow Dalit sisters about their duties and responsibilities that they needed to carry out during the battle. And she had a plan in her mind and a motto in her heart that is, no matter what consequences lie in front of her, she would do the things she is best known for. She will hold the role of a sniper. For this, she needed to be hidden somewhere so that the enemy wouldn't notice her and then she could kill the attackers. After issuing instructions to her battalion, she climbed up a people tree and began to shoot at the advancing British troops. Who were in good numbers, Uda Devi began shooting at them and she injured and killed plenty of British soldiers. Suddenly, a British officer noticed that many of the casualties had bullet wounds, indicating a steep and downward trajectory. He immediately suspected a hidden sniper and without fail, he ordered his officers to fire at the trees. Initially, Uda Devi missed many shots targeting her, but eventually, the British outgrew in numbers at shooting. That dislodged a rebel who fell dead to the ground. Upon investigation, the sniper was revealed as Uda Devi. William Forbes Michel, in reminiscences of Great Mutiny, writes of Uda Devi, She was armed with a pair of heavy old pattern cavalry pistols, one of which was in her belt still loaded, and her pouch was still about half full of ammunition. While from her perch in the tree, she had been carefully prepared before the attack. She had killed more than half a dozen men. The actual history of the Parsi caste is somehow lost to the world. The contributions they made passed without any record. The Parsis, like numerous other non-dominant castes of India, have existed for more than a millennia. Through continuous attempts, British tried to keep them away from the history. Even many African women were also employed in the court of the Avad emperors to guard the harem. They too perished in the battles in Lucknow during 1857. The British showed no mercy to anybody and these brave women fought valiantly without a second thought. Koi unhe abla kehta, koi kahe unhe mazboot. Which is to say that some people called them feeble women and others found them strong. Today, Uda Devi is an inspiration to women and each year on November 16th, members of the Parsi caste gather at the site of her final plunge and celebrate her as an anti-imperialist rebel who defied convention and struck a blow for the embryonic cause of Indian independence. They come from all over Western Bengal, Madhya Pradesh and Bihar to offer oblations to the image of Uda Devi Parsi. Many are women from remote villages who travel long distances to attend. Uda Devi Martyrdom Day is the day to revel in the bravery and martial spirit of their ancestors and to chant the rousing slogans like Uda Devi Amar Rahe and Uda Devi Zindabad. 53 days to go. Jai Hind, Jai Bharat. Bharat ki kahani. आजादी के लिए प्राणाहुति देने वाले पिछहत्तर अनाम वीरों की पिछहत्तर कहानियां मीनाक्षी लेखी की जुबानी आप सुनेंगे अमृत महोत्सव पोर्टल पर 1 जून 2022 से रोजाना भारत की कहानी मीनाक्षी लेखी की जुबानी आजादी के लिए प्राणाहुति देने वाले पिछहत्तर अनाम वीरों की Hello friends, Namaskar. How many stories would one have heard of someone arranging one's own posthumous return to one's motherland? Can you imagine the level of nationalism burning inside this man that before dying, he organized to perfection that his ashes were returned to his motherland, India. 
Such was Shyamji Krishna Varma's love for India. Such was his patriotism. No wonder this son of Gujarat was given the honor and respect due to him by another prodigal son of Gujarat, our Prime Minister Sri Narendra Modi ji in 2003 when he painstakingly worked towards bringing Shyamji and his wife's ashes back to India from Switzerland. 73 years after his death on August 22, 2003, Shyamji returned to his matrabhumi to infuse its soil with unending nationalism. The ashes were received by the then Chief Minister of Gujarat Sri Narendra Modi ji in 1930 when Shyamji died of failing health in Geneva but he had already made arrangements with the Swiss government to preserve his ashes for a hundred years and send it to India when it was free of British rule almost as if he knew that seven decades after his death an able leader of Gujarat would fulfill his desire to be united with his roots Shyamji Krishna Varma was born in 1857 in Kutch Gujarat after completing his secondary education in Bhuj he went to Mumbai for further education where he learned Sanskrit and other languages he chanced upon books on Vedas by Dayanand Saraswati who founded the Arya Samaj and became his followers he became the first president of the Bombay Arya Samaj After a meeting with Swami Dayanand Saraswati he became his disciple and started delivering lectures on Vedic philosophy and religion across India he soon developed a reputation as a very well known public speaker of Vedas he was given the title of pandit owing to his deep knowledge of the Vedas and Sanskrit by the pandits of Kashi in 1877 this was the first ever title of pandit given to anybody outside the pandit community In 1881 he represented India at the Berlin Congress of Orientalists and read a paper on Sanskrit as a living language of India. He was noticed by Professor Williams, a scholar of Sanskrit, who invited him to Oxford to assist and teach Sanskrit at the University of Oxford. He graduated as a barrister in law from Balliol College University of Oxford in 1883 and was invited to the bar to practice law. Shyamji returned to India and spent the next 10 years working as a diwan with several princely states such as Ratlam, Ajmer, Udaipur and Junagadh. He also practiced law and even assisted Lokmanya Tilak on certain bills. He however returned to England with his wife in 1897 and decided to continue supporting the war of independence against the British from outside of India. Dayanand Saraswati and Herbert Spencer the great philosophers were Shyamji's inspiration. After Spencer's death Shyamji started an annual lecture in his honor. In 1905 he founded the India House a student residence to promote nationalist views among Indian students in Britain. India House also granted scholarships to Indian youths for higher studies in England on the condition that they would not work for the British government. India House also provided shelter to Indian revolutionaries such as Bika Ji Kama, Vinayak Damodar Savarkar, Lala Hardayal and many others. Veer Savarkar had arrived in India House on Shivaji's fellowship in 1906 and eventually took over the reins of the India House when Shyamji left. Shyamji as a barrister in London remained a staunch nationalist. He also founded the Indian Home Rule Society and a monthly journal The Indian Sociologist. The purpose of the journal was to stimulate the Indian intellectuals to oppose the British rule in India and fight for its independence. But his support for Indian independence was viewed as sedition by the British government. Shyamji was removed from the members list of the Inner Temple and his degree of barrister was taken back. They even censored the journal The Indian Sociologist for publishing nationalistic material and also moved to arrest him for supporting political activities at the India House. Shyamji eventually had to escape from England to Paris where he restarted his welfare activities for Indians living abroad. In 1909, the British government sealed India House after Madan Lal Dhingra was sentenced to death for assassinating Sir Curzon Wylie since Madan Lal Dhingra frequented the meetings held at the India House. 
Shamji stayed in Paris for several years working for the independence of India. Later he moved his base to Geneva, Switzerland. There during the war he was denied delivering lectures due to British government's political pressure on Switzerland. However, after a lapse of 6 years, Shamji restarted the journal The Indian Sociologist in 1920, this time publishing it from Geneva. The lectures which he was denied delivering at public meetings during the war were published in this journal later. A town in Kutch has been named after Shamji called Shamji Krishna Verma Nagar to honor his contribution. The Kutch University too was renamed after him as Kranti Guru Shamji Krishna Verma Kutch University in Bhuj, Gujarat. In 1989 a postal stamp was issued by the government of India. in memory of shamji a memorial was also built in memory of shamji in madhavi in 2010 the memorial is spread over 52 acres and has a replica of the india house building statues of shamji and his wife along with the urns of ashes and a picture gallery not only this in 2015 the inner temple or the inns of court in london posthumously restored shamji as a member of the inn The vote to reinstate was unanimous and the council noted that Shamji did not receive a fair hearing. 52 days to go. Jai Hind, Jai Bharat. Bharat ki kahani Nakshi likhi thi zubani Aazadi ke liye pranahuti dene wale 75 anam veeron ki 75 kahaniyan. Meenakshi likhi ki zubani आप सुनेंगे अमृत महोत्सव पोर्टल पर 1 जून 2022 से रोजाना भारत की कहानी आजादी के लिए प्राणाहुति देने वाले 75 अनाम वीरों की 75 कहानियां मीनाक्षी लेखी की जुबानी हेलो फ्रेंड्स नमस्ते नमस्कार The fight for freedom is never easy but if the fight for freedom is undertaken by a woman then it is tougher many times over not because it requires risking one's life and carrying on in the face of death but because women involved in the freedom struggle had many battles to fight at many different levels battles that were not just against the british but even against one's own family the society one lived in and the mindsets of loved ones rajkumari gupta a huge contributor but lesser known freedom fighter epitomizes the double struggle of women fighting to free the country from a cursed british rule rajkumari had to pay dearly for her involvement with india's freedom struggle the cost she had to pay was high her in-laws not just threw her out of their home they even publicly disowned her by placing an advertisement in a publication announcing the separation on 9th august 1925 the british oppressors got a huge jolt a handful of young daring freedom fighters had managed to do the unthinkable chandrasekhar azad ram prasad bismil ashfaqullah khan rajendra lehri carried out an armed robbery more than 2 dozen people were involved directly or indirectly in this robbery Kakori lies 16 km northwest of Lucknow. It had been a normal practice to collect money from various railway stations en route and deposit it at the last railway station. In this case, the city where money had to be deposited was Lucknow. It was a well-planned operation masterminded by Chandrasekhar Azad in which the train was stopped at Kakori and the trunk which had the cash bags was opened the cash was taken away by the revolutionaries the money was to be used for undertaking nationalist activities of the Hindustan Socialist Republican Association it was a revolutionary organization led by Chandrasekhar Azad while the decoit itself was carried out by the four young men it could not have happened without rajkumari gupta's act of fearlessness the execution of the decoit needed the freedom fighters to be well equipped with arms and ammunition since the british were constantly keeping a close watch on the movements and actions of the members of azad's association 
Rajkumari stepped in to carry the ammunition for the attack with her 3 year old son in her lap Rajkumari hid the arms and ammunition in her underclothes and carried them to deliver it to Azad and his associates Rajkumari Gupta was born in 1902 to a father who was a grocer in Banda at the age of 13 she was married to Madan Mohan Gupta who supported the freedom movement and work for the congress after marriage Rajkumari Gupta joined her husband and participated in the non-cooperation movement after the Chauri Chaura incident. The non-cooperation movement was suddenly stopped on 4th February 1922. This dissuaded a number of people as it was difficult for them to understand how a successful movement could be suddenly ended. Rajkumari was one of those disappointed with the sudden turn of events. Rajkumari was of the belief that if one has to attain freedom from the British control it was important to start an armed rebellion slowly she drifted herself to the revolutionary movement and associated herself with the Hindustan Socialist Republican Association initially Rajkumari would carry messages and materials for the revolutionaries the mission was so secretive that even Rajkumari Gupta's husband and in-laws were not aware of it She could carry out her work in ease as she seemed to be a regular woman who was least suspected for being part of the revolutionary network as she was excellent in her job she was soon closely connected with the inner circle of Chandshekhar Azad in Allahabad Rajkumari Gupta once said hum upar se Gandhi wadi the aur niche se kranti wadi dressed in simple khadi sarees with her toddler son in tow Rajkumari would constantly undertake dangerous missions Soon after the Kakori train attack the British carried out a nationwide crackdown to arrest those involved in the episode Several people were arrested and jailed and later on put on trial Rajkumari was also being closely watched and one day she was carrying weapons to be delivered for a mission with a son in her arms she was arrested This incident came as a huge shock for her family since they were unaware of her underground association with freedom fighters at the end of crisis instead of supporting rajkumari gupta her family completely disowned her a news report was published in veer bhagat newspaper according to which the family of rajkumari gupta broke all ties with her it was an emotionally challenging time for rajkumari but her personal tragedy did not deter the brave heart she continued her fight to free her beloved country from the shackles of imperialism As a role in Kakori conspiracy case was confirmed she was tried in court and was sentenced to imprisonment on charges of supporting the revolutionaries who had been charged with conspiring against the British government through her nationalistic activities Rajkumari was arrested 3 times once in 1930 a second time in 1932 and third time in 1942 Rajkumari however had no regrets Her famous words for her difficult times in life were humko jo karna tha kiya the struggle in the life of rajkumari gupta was multifold she not only sacrificed an easy life at home a life of comfort where she would only look after her children and household chores but even ended up being abandoned by those she considered her closest after being disowned by the family rajkumari gupta led a secluded life there are many women like rajkumari who sacrificed their lives in the freedom movement but very little information is available about them these women were part of big events that left a big mark in the history of indian freedom struggle while a lot of information may be available on the incidents these women were involved in but names of women who were instrumental in executing the task has often gone missing from the records but these women who have silently kept the fire of the freedom struggle burning their spirit resonated in ashfaqullah khan's words kasli kamar ab to kasli kamar ab to kuch karke hi dikhayenge azad hi ho lenge ya phir sar hi kata denge 51 days to go jai hind jai bharat bharat ki kahani nakshi आजादी के लिए प्राणाहुति देने वाले पिछहत्तर अनाम वीरों की पिछहत्तर कहानियां मीनाक्षी लेखी की जुबानी आप सुनेंगे अमृत महोत्सव पोर्टल पर 1 जून 2022 से रोजाना रोजाना भारत
वक्त की कहानी आजादी के लिए प्राणाहुति देने वाले पिछहत्तर अनाम वीरों की पिछहत्तर कहानियां मीनाक्षी लेखी की जुबानी सत नमस्ते नमस्कार फ्रेंड्स टुडे आई ब्रिंग टू यू अ स्टोरी फ्रॉम द लैंड ऑफ पंजाब विच गेव बर्थ टू इन न्यूमरस फ्रीडम फाइटर्स सिंस टाइम इन मेमोरियल दिस स्टोरी इज अबाउट माता भाग कौर हु वॉज पॉपुलरली नोन एज माई भागो she was the first woman in punjab to fight on a battlefield in the year 1705 mai bhago was born in her family's ancestral home in chabal kala in the family of dhillo jat at jabal kala in the present day tarantaran district of punjab in her childhood mai bhag kaur was called bhag bhari which means fortunate mai bhago's father mallu shah was enrolled in guru hargobind's army and like her father mai bhago too learned shastra vidya and that was the training in arms her father was the son of bhai paresha a grandfather and paresha's brother bhai langa had served under guru arjan dev and guru hargobind bhai bhai langa had helped guru arjan dev in the construction of harmandir sahab and was one of the five warriors who accompanied guru arjan dev when he went to lahore for martyrdom in the year 1699 she visited anandpur with her father when guru gobind singh created the khalsa and was baptized along with other members of her family she had inherited from her family the ideals of bravery and courage faith truth and fearlessness were her ornaments She had a well-built body and started learning the art of warfare and horse riding from her father. Later on she married Bhai Nidhan Singh of Patti. After a few years in an attempt to capture the guru, the large Mughal army led by Wazir Khan of Sirhind under the orders of Emperor Aurangzeb proceeded to Anandpur Sahib. In 1704 the city of Anandpur Sahib the residence of Guru Gobind Singh ji was under extended siege by the combined forces of the Mughal army and the chieftains they demanded it be evacuated stopping provisions for food and siege lasting a few months the siege took its toll and the meager provisions were completely exhausted with the Sikhs having to live on leaves and bark from the trees they announced that any Sikh who would say that he or she is not any more a sikh of guru gobind singh would be left untouched while others would be done to death during this time the jats of maja made up their mind to go home a group of 46 chali mukhe led by mahan singh ratol told guru gobind singh that they were not his sikhs any more the guru told them that they would have to write a document that said we are not your sikhs any more and sign it All 46 wrote their names on the document known as Bedawa and left Guru Gobind Singh. Mai Bhago was distressed to hear that some of the Sikhs of a neighborhood who had gone to Anandpur to fight for Guru Gobind Singh had deserted him under the adverse conditions. She was smitten at the ignominy shown by these 40 deserters. Mai Bhago charged them with cowardice and lack of faith. She criticized them openly. The governor of Sirhind, Wazir Khan, was planning a big attack on Guru Gobind Singh. She could not hold herself and in zeal to serve the guru, she the great warrior said to her husband, "Let us lay down our lives for the guru who sacrificed his father, mother and four sons for the Sikh faith. We must not sit idle when innocent lives are being bricked alive." Known for her faith and courage, Bhago motivated the ladies of the area to challenge those deserters. These ladies dressed themselves up as soldiers and went to proceed with Mai Bhago. She said to the deserters, "Guruji has sacrificed his family and comforts for our freedom. We should not hide ourselves like cowards. Everybody has to die. Why not die like a brave person? If you don't join me, I shall take a party of women and die for the guru." deeply ashamed of their betrayal the deserters got armed and they took the oath to die fighting and not to retreat from the battlefield all of them marched to help the guru and seek his forgiveness 
under the leadership of the mighty Mai Bhago. They were informed that the Mughal forces under the command of the governor of Sirhind were proceeding towards the Guru. Feeling ashamed of their act of cowardice, they followed her banner and joined in the famous battle of Sir Muktsar Sahib, which was fought against the Mughal forces at Khidrana in the district of Firozpur. Mai Bhago vowed to suffer death on the blood-stained battlefield on behalf of the Guru. She fought so well in their ranks that she disposed of several enemy soldiers. Knowing that the enemy Wazir Khan was advancing to attack the Guru, Mai Bhago's group took up positions near a place called Khidrana. As the enemy forces came close, the Sikhs pounced on them. A fierce battle ensued. Although heavily outnumbered, the Sikhs attacked with ferocity and many were killed on both sides. The dust raised by the battle alerted Guru Gobind Singh Ji, who by this time had vacated Anandpur Sahib. He joined his Sikhs on a sandy hill, Tibi, and shot arrows on the enemy. As the battle raged, Guru Gobind Singh Ji mounted his horse and led his contingent from the west. The enemy could not stand a sudden attack on his left flank and after sustaining Heavy losses withdrew, leaving the dead and dying on the battlefield. The Chali Mukte, led by the great female general Mai Bhago, had brought such damage onto the Mughal force of 10,000 strong that they had no option but to retreat. This battle can be found even inside the British war history wonders. At the end of the battle, when Sri Guru Gobind Singh Ji was looking for survivors, Mai Bhago, who was lying wounded, greeted him. She told him how the 40 deserters had valiantly laid down their lives fighting in the battlefield. Guru Sahib was greatly touched by her sense of remorse, self-sacrifice and heroism. Mai Bhago recovered and remained in the Guru's presence after the battle of Sri Muktsar Sahib. When Sri Guru Gobind Singh Ji, along with his Sikhs, was collecting the dead body for cremation, he found one of them, named Mahan Singh, still clinging to life. On seeing the Guru, he made an effort to rise. The Guru at once took him in his embrace and sat down with him. Mahan Singh, tearful and exhausted, requested the Great Master to destroy the Bidhava, the letter, disclaiming his being a Sikh of the Guru. Before Mahan Singh died, his merciful Guru took the document and tore it up. You have redeemed yourself here and in the hereafter, Guru Gobind Ji said, showing infinite mercy towards his followers. Guru Gobind Singh Ji named these 40 deserters who had fought until their last breath. After returning to Sri Anandpur Sahib and fighting for the beloved Guru as Chali Mukte, 40 liberated ones or 40 immortals. After them, Khidarna became Sri Muktsar Sahib, the pool of liberation. Mai Bhago, in the meantime, was also laying in the battlefield wounded. Guruji blessed her for her courage and fortitude in leading the Sikhs into battle and regaining their honor. The Guru praised the bravery of Mai Bhago. In time, Mai Bhago recovered from her wounds and remained in the Guru's presence after the battle. The Guru asked her to go back to her village as her husband and brother had also obtained Shahidi in that battle. Instead, Mai Bhago followed Guru Sahib Ji to Nanded. She expressed her desire to become an active saint soldier and stay in the service of the Guru. Her wish was granted and she stayed with the Guru as a member of his bodyguards. She accompanied the Guru to Damdama Sahib, Agra and Nander and lived there until the Guru left this world in 1708. Mata Bhago settled in Bidhar, about 200 km from Nander, where she lived till her old age. Mata Bhagoji is held in the utmost high regard by Sikhs and considered a saint. Her spear and musket that she used in the battle at Muktsar is still preserved at Takhat Sri Hazur Sahib, Nander. She lived there and preached Sikhism till the end of her life. She was a symbol of bravery and courage. Till today, the Magh Mela is organized on the 12th and 13th of January to commemorate the sacrifice of those Chali Mukt. 
Recently, Mata Bhagpur, popularly known as Mai Bhago, was featured among three of the most fearless women in the history as little-known legend by BBC on the occasion of International Women's Day. I would like to dedicate a few lines in her honor. Tyagpat vidhirn kiya, khidrana ko muktsar kiya, bhago ko apne saath liya, angrakshak ka maan kiya, samanata ki leher chali, tri bhi ab veer bani, सोने की चिड़िया फिर चहके भागो की वीरता फिर महके 50 डेज टू गो जय हिंद जय भारत भारत की कहानी आजादी के लिए प्राणाहुति देने वाले पिछहत्तर अनाम वीरों की पिछहत्तर कहानियां मीनाक्षी लेखी की जुबानी आप सुनेंगे अमृत महोत्सव पोर्टल पर एक जून 2022 से रोजाना भारत की कहानी आजादी के लिए प्राणाहुति देने वाले पिछहत्तर अनाम वीरों की पिछहत्तर कहानियां मीनाक्षी लेखी की जुबानी नमस्ते नमस्कार हेलो फ्रेंड्स I bring to you today a story of the first woman spy of India a badge she rightly earned with the hard work and extreme sacrifice in working to topple the British empire in India Neera Arya from Bagpat in Uttar Pradesh was the rare case of a brave heart who did not even shy away from killing her own husband to save the life of Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose She was a veteran of the Indian National Army serving in the Rani of Jhansi regiment. Neera Arya was born on 5th March 1902 in a village called Khedka in Bagpat district of Uttar Pradesh. She lost her father Mahavir and mother Lakshmi Devi to an epidemic at the age of 5. Both Neera and her brother Basant were dependent on others for support. One day a wealthy businessman said Chuggu Mal visited Bagpat to attend a convention on Arya Samaj. There he met these two children. He adopted Neera and her brother and took them to Calcutta. Neera was educated in Calcutta. Chuggu Mal was a regular businessman and had no leanings towards the freedom struggle, but his life revolved around his daughter Neera. From childhood, Neera was a patriot. Her desire was to do something for the country as a young girl she participated in many activities associated with the freedom movement while Neera was occupied in the activities associated with the freedom movement Chagumal was busy expanding his business Chagumal was accompanied by Neera in his trips to different countries traveling provided Neera the opportunity to learn Hindi English and Bengali said Chagumal's only desire was to see Neera settled on 25th December 1928 she was married to Shrikant Jairanjan Das a CID inspector with the British after marriage Neera learned that her husband had arrested a number of freedom fighters the couple soon realized that they were two different people who were brought together by marriage while Shrikant Jairanjan Das was loyal to his British masters Neera continued to support the freedom movement. She joined the Jhansi regiment under Azad Hind Fauj, which was headed by Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose, who wanted to free the country from British control. The British government was not happy with the growing popularity of Subhash Chandra Bose and wanted to get rid of him. Neera's husband, Shrikant Jairanjan Das, was assigned the responsibility to assassinate Subhash Chandra Bose. Neera came to know of his plans. She was adamant to save Subhash Chandra Bose and asked her husband to choose between his wife and call of duty. Shrikant Jairanjan Das chose his service. At this moment, Neera left her house with her younger brother Basant and moved to Shahadra where she took tuitions in Sanskrit and English to earn a living. As part of Jhansi regiment, Neera received training under Lakshmi Sehgal. the first commander of the INA on 22nd October 1943 the Rani Jhansi regiment was formally inaugurated looking at the capability of Neera Arya she was taken in the intelligence wing and assigned the responsibility of spying besides being known as first woman spy of the country 
Neera was admired for fearlessness and dedication. Neera would often dress up like a boy and work in the houses of English families to gather information. Once Neera's friend Durga was caught by the British on charges of sedition. In order to free their friend, Neera along with her associate Saraswati reached the prison dressed as eunuchs. They distributed sedated prashad to the guards and managed to escape with Durga. British officers fired their guns to stop their escape, but the three women managed to escape. Later, Neera Arya was made the captain of the regiment and was given the responsibility to protect Subhash Chandra Bose. There came a time when both husband and wife Sri Kant, Jairanjan Das and Neera Arya came face to face, supporting two different ends. With Neera supporting the freedom struggle and Sri Kant supporting the oppressors. Sri Kant, Jairanjan Das fired at Subhash Chandra Bose. Fortunately, he escaped, but the bullet hit his driver. Neera grasped the seriousness of the situation and immediately sprung into action. In a bid to save Subhash Chandra Bose, she stabbed her husband Sri Kant Jairanjan Das, leading to his death. This incident did not go down well with the British if Neera had not intervened. Subhash Chandra Bose would have been killed. And not just that, Neera had attacked Sri Kant Jairanjan Das, who was a British official. Killing him meant treason. Neera Arya was arrested on 3rd May 1945 and was kept in Calcutta jail. Her case was tried at the Red Fort. While others were released, Neera was sentenced to life imprisonment for killing her husband. Neera was given Kala Pani and sent to Andaman. All sorts of atrocities were inflicted on Neera at Andaman. She was put under iron chains. She was not given blanket to cover herself in the cold and was forced to sleep on the floor. With chains wrapped on her neck, it was difficult to lie down. But Neera never begged for any kind of comfort in the cellular chain. While narrating her story, Neera said, All prisoners at Andaman were stuffed into tiny cells. There were many other women who served Kalapani. While living in the cell, my only worry was that I was not getting an opportunity to participate in the freedom movement. I was confined to an unknown island in the middle of the sea and there was no hope of release. On one occasion, two guards entered her cell in the midnight and threw a blanket at Neera. She did not like it, but did not mind covering oneself in the cold. Next day, a blacksmith was called to cut off the chains of Neera. As the blacksmith started cutting off the shackles, he cut off some flesh from Neera's hand. Then came the turn of the legs. The blacksmith hit the heavy hammer thrice on Neera's leg. Neera complained and asked the blacksmith to be watchful of where he was hitting. The reply came that he could even hit the hammer on her heart. Neera was angry as she was in pain and told the blacksmith to respect women. The jailer was a witness to the incident and was watching the event up close. Knowing fully well that Neera was in pain, the jailer asked her about Sebastian Bose's whereabouts. He offered her freedom in exchange. The reply of Neera was, he died in the plane crash. Everyone is aware of it. It is a common knowledge. The jailer replied, you're lying. Sebastian Bose is still alive. The jailer again said, Where is he? angrily. Neera replied, In my heart, in my mind. The jailer was infuriated. He shouted, If Subhash Chandra Bose is in her heart, then remove him from there. The jailer touched Neera inappropriately and tore all her clothes. He indicated to the blacksmith to remove her breast. On the orders of the jailer, the blacksmith immediately took a breast ripper and started pressing onto Neera's right breast to cut it off. While the breast was being cut, the pain crossed all limits. The jailer held Neera by neck and said, If you argue any more, he will take off the other one as well. The jailer hit Neera with a tweezer lying in the cell. The jailer added, be thankful to our Queen Victoria, it is as per her order that the breast ripper is not heated. Post-independence, all prisoners were freed from the Andaman jail. Neera Arya spent the rest of her life selling flowers at Falaknuma in Hyderabad. On 26 July 1998, Neera died 
at Osmania Hospital after prolonged illness. Independent India owes Meera Arya its every breath. Without women like her, India could not have unshackled itself from the British slavery. 49 days to go. Jai Hind, Jai Bharat. Bharat ki kahani. आजादी के लिए प्राणाहुति देने वाले पिछहत्तर अनाम वीरों की पिछहत्तर कहानियां मीनाक्षी लेखी की जुबानी आप सुनेंगे अमृत महोत्सव पोर्टल पर 1 जून 2022 से रोजाना रोजाना भारत की कहानी आजादी के लिए प्राणाहुति देने वाले पिछहत्तर अनाम वीरों की पिछहत्तर कहानियां मीनाक्षी लेखी की जुबानी हेलो फ्रेंड्स नमस्ते नमस्कार टुडे आई विल बी टेलिंग यू द स्टोरी ऑफ राजकुमारी अमृत कौर मेनी ऑफ यू वुड हैव हर्ड दैट एम्स इज द बेस्ट हॉस्पिटल इन द कंट्री एंड सम ऑफ यू वुड हैव क्रॉस द फ्लाई ओवर वेयर एम्स इज लोकेटेड डू यू नो दैट इट वॉज राजकुमारी अमृत कौर who established all india institute of medical sciences in delhi she was the first health minister of the country and served the country as a cabinet minister for 10 years from 1947 to 1957 rajkumari amrit kaur was born in lucknow in the royal family of kapurthala to raja harnam singh on 2nd february 1889 she was the only daughter in a family of seven sons Her father had converted to Christianity as a young boy therefore was kept out of line of succession to the throne as a child Rajkumari Amritkaur was homeschooled in Lucknow and was later sent to Shebon at Dorsetshire in England she excelled in school was the head girl and captain of the cricket and hockey team she continued to study in England and graduated from the University of Oxford Rajkumari Amrit Kaur was deeply impressed by the teachings of Gandhi ji and would often write letters to him from England. Her enduring relationship with Gandhi ji is documented as letters to Rajkumari Amrit Kaur. On her return to India in 1919, she wanted to join the freedom movement but was denied permission by Gandhi ji because he thought that coming from a royal family it will be difficult for her to refrain from the comforts of a material life. As Rajkumari Amrit Kaur's parents were also not keen on her joining the freedom struggle, she refrained from active participation. In the initial years of her return to India, she devoted herself to the cause of women. She worked tirelessly for the abolition of the parda system, child marriage, and so on and so forth. She wanted children to be disciplined. and added sports as a part of school curriculum later she established the sports club of india rajkumari amrit kaur was a visionary and wanted to establish a truly equal and emancipated society works she undertook are a proof of this exemplary vision in 1926 she established the all india mahila conference a non-profit organization which works on women's rights She strongly criticized Ramsey McDonald's communal award of 1932 which presented separate electorates. She was in favor of joint electorate. She did not believe in separating the two. She even advocated for equality with no reservation of seats for women. She demanded a universal adult franchise as was a strong supporter of the Uniform Civil Code. Upon her father's death in 1930 She left Kapurthala Palace and joined Gandhi ji's Sevagram Ashram in 1934 where she was given the task to maintain cleanliness in the ashram and serve the harijans. It was a test put forth for Rajkumari Amrit Kaur by Gandhi ji. She passed the test with flying colors and soon joined Mahatma Gandhi as his secretary. A position she held for next 16 years. In the year 1936, Mahatma Gandhi expressed the desire to include More and more women in the freedom struggle Gandhi ji wrote a letter to Rajkumari Amrit Kaur I am now in search of a woman who would realize the mission are you that woman will you be the one Rajkumari Amrit Kaur worked 
very closely with Mahatma Gandhi and because of this close proximity she was put in jail on charges of sedition in 1937 she was part of the dandi march and was brutally assaulted during a lathi charge which took a toll on her health in 1942 She was again put behind bars on charges of working against the British government during the Quit India movement. She was eventually released from jail and put under house arrest in Shimla. Rajkumari Amrit Kaur remained a staunch Gandhian all her life. Wore khadi and led a simple life within Seva Gram Ashram. In 1947 she became the first woman to become a cabinet minister. In 1950 she established the Indian Red Cross Society. In the year 1956 she introduced the AIMS bill in the parliament making way for the establishment of the All India Institute of Medical Sciences. She worked hard to garner support and collect international funding for establishing AIMS. The aim was to raise the level of medical education within the country. Aims is the first hospital in Asia which prohibits its doctors from undertaking private practice. The doctors at Aims are expected to spend time on only three activities: treating patients, teaching students, and undertaking research. Till date, Aims serves as an excellent institute for healthcare and medical research. Rajkumari Amrit Kaur was a strong advocate of the nursing profession and was instrumental in setting up several nursing institutes in the country. She went ahead and established the Tuberculosis Association of India and the Central Leprosy Teaching and Research Institute in Madras. She was one of the founders members of Delhi's Lady Irwin College. As health minister, she waged a war against the deadly disease of malaria while working for the welfare of children. She founded the Indian Council of Child Welfare. At the age of 75, she passed away on 6 February 1964, leaving behind a legacy which will be remembered for generations. She was cremated as per Sikh rituals at the Yamuna Ghats in the presence of Roman Catholic Archbishop of New Delhi, who also carried out Christian burial rituals for her. She not just fought for the country's freedom but also worked to uplift women and save the life of children from life threatening diseases. Rajkumari Amrit Kaur is a classic case of loving even beyond one's time through one's karmas and deeds. 48 days to go. Jai Hind, Jai Bharat. Bharat ki kahani आजादी के लिए प्राणाहुति देने वाले पिछहत्तर अनाम वीरों की पिछहत्तर कहानियां मीनाक्षी लेखी की जुबानी आप सुनेंगे अमृत महोत्सव पोर्टल पर 1 जून 2022 से रोजाना भारत की कहानी आजादी के लिए प्राणाहुति देने वाले पिछहत्तर अनाम वीरों की पिछहत्तर कहानियां मीनाक्षी लेखी की जुबानी हेलो फ्रेंड्स नमस्ते नमस्कार सत श्री अकाल टुडे आई ब्रिंग टू योर स्टोरी फ्रॉम द लैंड व्हिच गेव बर्थ टू द मोस्ट नंबर ऑफ फ्रीडम फाइटर्स एंड दैट इज पंजाब वी ऑल नो अबाउट भगत सिंह द ग्रेट रेवोल्यूशनरी एंड थिंकर बट नॉट मेनी ऑफ अस नो ऑफ द मैन हु वाज हिज इंस्पिरेशन इट वाज हिज अंकल सरदार अजीत सिंह संधू हु आल्सो प्लेड अ मेजर रोल इन द इंडियन फ्रीडम स्ट्रगल Their family had a rich tradition of fighting for the country. Sardar Fateh Singh, Ajit Singh's grandfather, had fought against the British in Anglo-Sikh war in Maharaja Ranjit Singh's army. His father Arjun Singh was a social reformer of Arya Samaj who opposed untouchability. Ajit was the younger brother of Bhagat Singh's father Kishan Singh. They belonged to the farming community of Punjab in the district of Jalandhar. Born in 1881, Ajit did his initial schooling in Jalandhar. Thereafter, briefly studying law in Bareilly College and DAV College, Lahore. He was introduced to the freedom struggle during his days in Bareilly and Lahore. He was so moved by the idea that he quit his studies in law and came back to his hometown, where the peasants were struggling against the British. Ajit along with his brother Kishan Singh traveled to the famine hit states of Madhya Pradesh and Gujarat and worked for flood affected victims in Srinagar and earthquake victims in Kangra this gave him 
an on-ground view of the real situation of the people of India. Punjab was known to be a prosperous state with agriculture in abundance. However, the state of the farmers was deteriorating because of the numerous famines, plague and increased taxation by the British. What had now brought things to a boil were three new laws which the British wanted to impose on the farmers. The Punjab Land Alienation Act of 1900, the Punjab Land Colonization Act of 1906, and the Bari Doab Canal Act of 1907. The three acts together would have crippled the farmers. One reduced the farmers to mere sharecroppers. They were no longer allowed to build or fell trees on their land. Another increased the prices of the use of water from the canals. Yet another ensured that if there were no legal heirs of a farmer, then the land would be acquired by the British government on its own. The British did not stop at just this, they also increased the water tax and land revenue. This spelled doom for the farmers who were already under huge debt from the money lenders. Ajit, along with his brother Kishan Singh and friend Ghasit Ram, established the Bharat Mata Society in 1906, followed by a book agency by the same name to bring out publications with pro-Indian freedom issues. The British seized most of the publications and destroyed them, but many of them were saved and remained popular amongst people. Their other revolutionary friends remained members of the organization, such as Lala, Ram Sarandas, Deen Dayal Bake, Kishan Singh and others. The group focused on systematically informing the farmers about the implications of the laws they would congregate in public or religious places to sit down with farmers and clear their doubts. Soon enough, a wave of public rallies, demonstrations and conventions started taking place in Lahore and the neighbouring regions with thousands of people attending. Ajit would address the meeting, speaking about not just the representative laws but also the plundering that the British were undertaking. Their biggest rally was organised in Lailpur in March 1907 where Bake Dayal, newspaper editor of Jhang Sayal, sang his song Pagdi Sambhal Jatta, Pagdi Sambhaloe. The song became an instant hit with the people as it resonated with each individual. It became the very soul of the movement and the movement itself was thereafter called the Pagdi Sambhal Jatta movement. It was led by Ajit Singh to awaken the farmers, organize them and to protest against the British regime, to repeal their unjust laws. The movement used two weapons, speeches and publications, to spread their message. It was supported by stalwarts like Lala Lajpat Rai and other revolutionaries like Sufi Amba Prasad, Lal Chand Falak, Swaran Singh, Thakur Das Duri, Pindi Das among others. The British saw this as another 1857 rebellion and moved quickly to crush it. They arrested Sardar Swaran Singh, Sardar Kishan Singh, Lala Govardhan Das, Mahashek Ghasita Ram, Lal Chand Falak, Lala Govardhan Das and Pandit Ram Chand Peshavri. In 1907, arrest warrants were issued and Ajit was arrested along with Lala Lajpat Rai and deported to Burma, which is Myanmar today for delivering inciting speeches. They were lodged in Mandalay jail for six months. Punjab saw a lot of unrest and violence during that period. Ultimately, the British had to yield and repeal all the three laws. Ajit Singh and Lala Lajpat Rai were released and returned to India, where they continued their fight against the British for India's freedom. Fearing arrest again, Ajit escaped with fellow revolutionary Sufi Amba Prashad to Iran via Karachi in 1909. He lived in disguise as a teacher under the name Mirza Hassan Khan for about eight years, continuously working to support the Indian freedom struggle. When the British started to make it difficult for him in Iran, Ajit escaped to Paris. There he worked towards organizing people to support India's liberation from all across Europe. He founded the Bharatiya Krantikari Sangh and remained on the run, moving from one European country to another to escape being arrested. He lived in Switzerland, where he, it is said that he met communist leader Lenin. While in Brazil, he worked closely with Hindustan Gadar Party. And it is here that he received the news of his nephew Bhagat Singh's hanging. 
Ajit in his autobiography notes a correspondence with his nephew Bhagat Singh wherein he asks his nephew to come to Brazil to study the revolutionary struggles of other countries to which Bhagat Singh replied that he should instead return to lead the struggle in India as it was ready for a revolutionary struggle in 1932 He returned to Europe once again. In Italy, he met Subhash Chandra Bose and founded the Friends of India Society. Using the Roman radio to air speeches, he tried to help enlist Indian soldiers. Over 10,000 Indian soldiers began training. This was the foundation of the Azad Hind Fauj. However, once Italy was defeated in the Second World War, the plan failed, and Ajit was arrested and sent to jails in Italy and Germany. where he remained till 1945 this damaged his health and old comrades started to mount pressure on pandit nehru asking for ajit's release in 1946 ajit returned to india however the indian high commission prohibited him from attending any felicitations or programs honoring his release after 38 years he returned to india landing in karachi where he received a hero's welcome on arrival He briefly remained in Delhi and went to Lahore where he received a warm welcome. From there he was moved to Dalhousie to recuperate from his deteriorating health. On the morning of India's independence, Sardar Ajit Singh breathed his last, aware that India had got freedom for its oppressors, the British. A samadhi was created in his memory in Dalhousie. which today is a popular picnic spot for many in Panchpula in 1999 government of india's postal department issued a commemorative stamp in sardar ajit singh's honor let us take inspiration from this brave son of ma bharti and contribute in building a new india in this amrit kal 47 days to go jai hind jai bharat bharat ki kahani आजादी के लिए प्राणाहुति देने वाले पिछहत्तर अनाम वीरों की पिछहत्तर कहानियाँ मीनाक्षी लेखी की जुबानी आप सुनेंगे अमृत महोत्सव पोर्टल पर 1 जून 2022 से रोजाना रोजाना भारत की कहानी आजादी के लिए प्राणाहुति देने वाले पिछहत्तर अनाम वीरों की पिछहत्तर कहानियाँ मीनाक्षी लेखी की जुबानी नमस्कार हेलो फ्रेंड्स टुडे आई ब्रिंग टू योर स्टोरी फ्रॉम द हार्ट ऑफ इंडिया मध्य प्रदेश इन 2019 व्हेन प्राइम मिनिस्टर नरेंद्र मोदी जी वॉज कैंपेनिंग इन खरगांव इन मध्य प्रदेश ही स्पोक अबाउट भीमा नायक द रॉबिन हुड ऑफ निमार्ड and his contribution to the India's independence movement in his speech the prime minister lauded bhima's role in ambagani war of 1857 and drew a parallel between bhima's work and that of mangal pandey the hero of the 1857 war of independence this was the first time that due credit for bhima nayak's contribution to the freedom struggle was being given from the prime minister's office bhima was no more a chapter tucked away in crevices of history bhima nayak was a tribal warrior whose very mention made british officers shiver in fear as a single man army bhima alone had jolted the british administration several times leaving the officers forever on their toes as far as his activities were concerned while bhima had picked up the cudgels against the british by himself he realized the importance of bringing together all tribals against the british and fighting a consolidated battle the british were afraid of bhima's influence on tribals mainly the bheels and were keen that this set of fearless warriors stayed away from the wars of independence the tribals had a distinct advantage in their fight against the british they were not just fearless but were trained in warfare and could engineer surprise attack on british making them a formidable lot against the oppressors bhima's work towards uniting the tribals against the british therefore was a huge blow to the british empire in india 
In fact, almost 40 years before the 1857 War of Independence, the tribals had started a conflict against the British in 1818. The Beels used swords, strips, slings, gaffle, gulel, and stones and rocks to ambush the British, while the oppressors used guns and cannons. Despite this, the tribals not just damaged the British army patrol parties, but to an extent, even stalled the other activities that the tribals hated and opposed. The British treated tribals in India like petty criminals. This led to even women and children amongst heels to take up arms against the British and revolt. The uprising of the tribals was brutally crushed by the British by gunning down thousands of them. Those who escaped the gun were tried in courts and hanged to death. Women were held hostage and brutalities inflicted upon them. Bhima Nair, along with his other tribal associates, kept Khandesh boiling with the company government in Khandesh at constant war with the tribals from 1818 to 1858. The tribal heroes rocked the hills and valleys of Satpura with attacks on the British where over 50 young heroes took part in it and staged 50-60 small and big uprisings against the British. On one such occasion, two Bheel brothers, Khaza Nayak, Khazi Singh and Bhima Nayak under Bhima's leadership defeated the British government officer, Kennedy, when his contingent was attacked. Bhima Nayak warned the police officers in Khandesh to give up supporting the British tyranny or face dire consequences. Bhima Nayak, who considered himself a representative of the Emperor of Delhi in Khandesh, meant every word of his threat. The government and the police were shocked by Bhima Nayak's statement and announced a reward for his arrest. Over time, the reward on Bhima Nayak was increased to 2,000 rupees, a princely sum by any imagination. On April 11, 1858, a thrilling battle started in Ambapani in the Satpura mountain range. The government took steps to suppress the Bheels. Officers Kennedy, Major Evans and Colonel Byron were leading the British contingent. The route from Sendhwa Ghat to Bombay was very important for trade and military purposes. The British could not afford to risk it. The tribals knew the area well and could easily hide on hilltops and nooks and crannies. The British government was struggling to save itself. Bhima Nayak and his accomplices were hiding on a narrow hilltop. The tribals were attacked by over 2,000 soldiers. The British guns were matched by the slingshots and slashes of the tribals. A massive struggle went on till the British managed to capture the Bheels. The tribals had been defeated but not before damaging British troops and property. 16 British soldiers were killed, 45 injured and 7 people went missing. The tribals faced massive losses as well. More than 60 tribals killed, at least 100 men were arrested and 200 women and children captured. Tribal heroes had used guerrilla tactics to deceive the British. A fierce battle had ensued which had left the British shaken. While a lot of facts about Bhima Nayak's work are still unknown, it is certain that the work area of Bhima has remained from the state of Barani to Khandesh to present-day Maharashtra. When the British could not catch Bhima on their own, they turned his own people against him to capture the Braveheart. Legend has it that Tatya Tope met Bhima Nayak on a visit to Nimar. It was also during this trip that Bhima helped Tatya Tope cross Narmada River. Bhima was born in Panchmohali village in Badwani district. The tribals in Badwani revered Bhima and fought the battle for independence from the British under the leadership. The British led a long chase to capture Bhima Nayak, were unable to do so despite several attempts. They then influenced people close to Bhima and coerced them in leaking information about Bhima's whereabouts. On April 2nd, 1868, Bhima was captured by the British in the thick forest of Satpura Hills while he was sleeping. He was tried in court and then transported to Port Blair Jail to serve Kalapani. He was hanged to death on December 29, 1876. With a battalion of 3,000 people with him, Bhima Nayak had made it difficult for the British to live in peace in Nimar and surrounding areas. He destroyed 71 stations of the British with his bows and arrows. A memorial statue has been erected in the village Duava Bavdi 
to pay respect to his contribution to the freedom struggle. Forty-six days to go. Jai Hind, Jai Bharat. Bharat ki kahani. आजादी के लिए प्राणाहुति देने वाले पिछहत्तर अनाम वीरों की पिछहत्तर कहानियां मीनाक्षी लेखी की जुबानी आप सुनेंगे अमृत महोत्सव पोर्टल पर 1 जून 2022 से रोजाना